Now, let's look at the indictment itself. As I said, it was released only within the last hour before we came onto our show. So I'm not going to report to do an in-depth dive into this indictment because that would be a disservice for me to do so without taking the necessary time. But I was able to discern a pretty good amount. I obviously read the indictment through twice. I was able to, based on my prior knowledge of what this indictment was likely to be, able to draw some conclusions that I think are based in some pretty confident and reliable facts. So let's look at what we do know. Here you see it. It is from the special prosecutor, uh, Jack Smith, and it is filed in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, which means if it goes to trial, it will be tried with a jury of residents of the District of Columbia. Unlike the document case, the one alleging that Donald Trump harbored top secret documents at Mar-a-Lago, which would be tried before a Florida jury. They already have that other case in New York that will be tried before a Manhattan jury. So there's a very good chance Donald Trump will be convicted on one of these or more of these charges. And there's no guarantee this is the last one coming. As I said, liberals were really hoping for this sweeping indictment that accused Trump of being guilty of treason, basically, of being part of an insurrection, of inciting an insurrection. And it doesn't do that. It doesn't allege that he incited violence at the Capitol. It doesn't charge him with crimes pertaining to violence at the Capitol. Instead, it essentially says that the claims he made repeatedly, both in public and in the courts, that the election results were the byproduct of fraud in the election were false, that he knew them to be false, and that by conspiring with his lawyers like Rudy Giuliani and others, it names six, or it refers to six co-conspirators without naming them, although it seems clear we know who some of them are based on who meets the description, that it was a conspiracy to unlawfully obstruct the January 6th proceeding as well as the 2020 vote. Now, how that is a crime is a very difficult question to answer. So let me show you the key paragraphs of what I think are the key paragraphs of the indictment based on my preliminary read of it. So he's charged with four different counts. So you see it on the screen. Let's put the caption back on the screen. Count one is conspiracy to defraud the United States. Count two is conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Count three is obstruction of and attempts to obstruct an official proceeding. And count four is a conspiracy against voting rights, meaning an attempt to deny the voting rights of other people by falsely claiming the election was fraudulent. Now, we covered on this show before, and it is very relevant to note that there have been a thousand people, a thousand people, criminally charged in connection with the January 6th riot. The vast majority of them are nonviolent, by which I do not mean that I believe they didn't engage in violence. What I mean by that is that they're not alleged to have engaged in violence. They're alleged to have entered the Capitol, to have believed that the election was the byproduct of fraud. And yet, many of them have been charged with felonies, felonies for nonviolent political protest. And there has always been a question, how is it that people who American citizens who are involved in nonviolent political protest We've watched violent protests break out all throughout 2020, and members of the Democratic Party often raise money for their bail, and very few of them were actually charged with felonies or even misdemeanors unless they really harm somebody through violence. So the question is, how do you turn people who did not engage in violence or are protesting an election into criminals? And one of the ways they did that in the District of Columbia was by using a law that was enacted after the Enron scandal involving this company that was apparently a huge success. Paul Krugman was on his board making $50,000 a month or so. And it turned out the whole thing was a Ponzi scheme. And they enacted a law called Sarbanes-Oxley after the Maryland Democratic Senator Paul Sarbanes that made it a crime to obstruct official proceedings because they were attempting to make it a felony for people to block legal investigations into financial fraud the way they did with Enron. And prosecutors in the January 6th case, the DOJ, took this proceeding and tried to say that they could use it to turn into felons people who are protesting at January 6th because they too have obstructed official proceedings. The problem with that was it was an extremely dubious interpretation because there's nothing about the January 6th proceeding that's actually a substantive proceeding. It's a purely ministerial act. And ironically, the prosecution, in order to argue that that was a felony, 
had to essentially say that January 6th proceeding at the Capitol was a real decision making a real decision making ceremony that it was not just ceremonial or ministerial to just rubber stamp the certified voting results of the states that the Senate really did have the right to reject the electorates if they had wanted, which ironically is the view of Trump and his lawyers that they were trying to get Mike Pence to adopt. But nobody cared about the rights of the January 6th defendants. The Q shaman was sentenced to over four years in prison. Even though he wasn't accused at all of committing crimes, we saw what he did on January 6th. It wasn't anything remotely violent or threatening. Because the liberal establishment decided that this was one of the worst acts in American history. It was an insurrection. They were going to punish these people no matter what, regardless of legal niceties. And that's very similar to what this indictment seems to me to be. They're just so enraged that Trump claimed the 2020 election was the byproduct of fraud that they're determined come hell or high water to indict him and criminalize him for it, even though it's far from obvious. Even if you believe he did everything the indictment alleges, to know what crime was committed by doing so. So let's look at paragraph three of the indictment. And it is an, a paragraph that is intended to say, we acknowledge Trump had the right to do certain things. And we want to make clear we are not prosecuting Trump for doing the things we acknowledge he had a right to do. Quote, the defendant had a right, like every American, to speak publicly about the election and even to claim falsely that there had been outcome determinative fraud during the election and that he had won. So they're saying he was allowed to say, I'm the real winner of the 2020 election. There was fraud in this election that changed the results, even if what he was saying was false. He has that right. They acknowledge that. A free speech right. Quote, he was also entitled to formally challenge the results of the election through lawful and appropriate means, such as by seeking recounts or audits of the popular vote in states, or filing lawsuits challenging ballots and procedures. And of course, that's what Trump did as well. And they're acknowledging he had the right to do that, even if the claims on which those challenges and lawsuits are based were false. They go on, quote, indeed, in many cases, the defendant did pursue these methods of contesting the election results. His efforts to change the outcome in any state through recounts, audits, or legal challenges were uniformly unsuccessful. So the question becomes, if you acknowledge that Trump had the right to do all of those things, how is it that you're able to file four federal felony counts against him in connection with his allegation that the election was the byproduct of fraud? And here's what they say in paragraph four, quote, shortly after election day, the defendant also pursued unlawful means of discounting legitimate votes and subverting the election results. In doing so, the defendant perpetrated three criminal conspiracies. Quote, a one, a conspiracy to defraud the United States by using dishonesty, fraud, and deceit to impair, obstruct, and defeat the lawful federal government function by which the results of the presidential election are collected, counted, and certified by the federal government in violation of 18 U.S.C. 371. Number two, a conspiracy to corrupt, to corruptly obstruct and impede the January 6th congressional proceeding at which the collected results of the presidential election are counted and certified in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1512. And three, a conspiracy against the right to vote and to have one's vote counted in violation of 18 U.S.C. 241. Now, if you spend your time reading this indictment as we did before the show, and again, I don't want to suggest I conducted an in-depth scholarly study of it because we didn't have the time to do that. But if you read it just on the first and second reading, you will see that there's very little substance to what they're claiming Trump did beyond the things they claim and acknowledge and concede he has the right to do, which is challenge the election, the results of the election by claiming it was the byproduct of fraud. They use a lot of uh, accusatory words. A conspiracy to un use unlawful means. They talk about the attempt to overturn the results in, Washington, in Arizona and Wisconsin. They talk about the pressure put on Mike Pence to reject the electorates presented at the January 6th hearing. But it's unclear within the scope of what they've conceded he has the right to do any of that 
encompass that went beyond what they acknowledged he had the legal right to do. He tried to overturn the Wisconsin and Arizona results through the lawful means of suing in court and trying to speak with people in those states to gather evidence that fraud was committed. And with regard to the attempt to convince Mike Pence to reject the electorates, he had lawyers telling him that those theories were valid, that Pence had that power. He, they cite things that where Trump admitted, this seems kind of crazy, but that's hardly a proof that you know you're engaging in fraud. That seems kind of crazy, but it seems like the lawyers are right. So I don't want to sit here and vigorously defend Trump from this indictment. But what I'm telling you is that if you're going to indict the former president of the United States, the person who is currently the leading oppositional figure to the incumbent president, you need to have very solid ground for doing so. That was our claim about the ridiculous, preposterous, laughable Alvin Bragg indictment in Manhattan. And what I acknowledge is the stronger but still frivolous claim that he committed felonies by contain by holding classified documents that he had every right to declassify had he wanted to, given how often in Washington, every single day, you can pick up the Washington Post or the New York Times and see that people are leaking classified information without authorization because it serves their interest to do so. People in Washington are never convicted or charged with crimes for doing the sort of thing Trump did in that case or the one in Manhattan, nor is this even close to a strong indictment? And I think they're playing with huge fire by piling up these criminal indictments in a way that polls already show at least half of the voting electorate perceives to be abusive and politicized to the point that it's strengthening Trump when they do so because they don't really have very compelling evidence that he committed serious crimes of the type that justify bringing these charges against him in the context of how politicians are usually treated. And I think we should think about what our media would be saying, what our establishment would be saying, if in some other country that was a country we're taught to dislike in Russia, or Iran, or Venezuela, or whomever, where they do actually have elections, if the government in place looked at polling data that showed there was an oppositional politician gaining popularity, this is what is said about Putin and Alvani, for example, and the government is instead of engaging them in debate or trying to defeat them in elections, instead putting them in prison on dubious charges. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.